So let's pray as we prepare to, to hear from God's word, hopefully from God's word, and I'll get out the way. Lord, we want to hear what you have to say to us, please, just by who you are and your character, Lord, and how that dictates your plan and, and what you're doing in us and in this world and in this universe. Lord, we are just a part of that, but we're so thankful to be a part of it. And Lord, please open our eyes now. In your name and for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so when you, you take a study... So by, by the way, so this is my first time I'm trying to preach from my tablet. So we'll see how we go with that. We'll try and make sure it's big enough to read. Now you can experiment when you're on camp. A few different things. But... The, yeah, so we're studying the attributes of God. So, like I said, it takes you right through the plan of his creation. So, that's for, for his glory and for his pleasure. And we can, see, we can see how that derives from his character. Which is where everything derives from anyway. The whole universe that he created has got his fingerprint on it. And even the stuff that's bad, that's his allowance. Uh, because it serves his purpose in the long run. And we'll, we'll see a bit of that as we go through. And as we can see, if you've got the sheet there, you see it starts, we're going to start with his love. So his love is where it begins and his love is where it ends. So we're going to take a travel around that heart. That's kind of the symbolism there, I suppose. So we've got those 12 attributes. We'll just sort of skim through them today and, and see where that takes us. So we started with love. So as I said, and uh, that's the fundamental element of God's character. Because before anything was created, if there's such a thing as before, I always find it funny to say before because time didn't exist, but God in his essence is relational, isn't he? Father, Son and Holy Spirit. He's love, love relationship. So it's fundamental to God himself, his love. But that's also why he created in the first place. He created us to be loved and to love him back. And that's because he's personal. And that's another one of the attributes we'll talk about for a little while in a little while. But he's knowable, personal. So he can and does love. So that's, just, that's the first point. But, of course, he, to love us, he has to have a relationship with us, with someone who has their own free will. So he created us with free will, and of course we chose in free will to do our own thing. So we fell as, as mankind, as we did. And God always knew we would, and that's part of the plan too. But we fell, so there was a problem. So we've got a God who loves, but a fallen human race. Now that's a problem because of the next attribute. No, I haven't got to, so I'll skip into that. We're going to build these up as we go. So we're heading to the left there, up and left. And so the issue then is with his holiness. So God cannot have a relationship with us since he's perfect and we're not. Because holy may, fundamentally means set apart. To be holy, set something as holy, you set it apart for a special purpose. And part of that is the idea that we often think of a holy means pure, which is certainly that. God is set apart and pure and sinless and perfect. But it fundamentally means set apart. So he's altogether beyond us. So we have that problem. We have He loved, created us, but we sinned, and then he's holy and we sin. so there's that disconnect. So there's a problem. What does he do? Because unless he does something for us, it's game over. You know, there's... He's failed in his creation plan. So yeah, that's the point. His love he says he wants to relate to us, but his holiness says he can't. So the two attributes of God sort of in conflict when, since we messed up. So now what? Well, God is merciful. This is where the, the other attributes kick in. Now we need to clarify what mercy is compared to grace. Now I mentioned it yesterday. Anyone want to yeah. Note the difference. What's the difference? Mercy is not getting what you deserve, and yep. grace is getting reverse, getting what um, you don't deserve. Don't deserve. That's it. Yeah, you're getting that. That's it. Excellent. That's right. So, here's an example. Mercy would be if a judge spares a criminal from, you know, when they've proven guilty, but he spares the criminal. That would be mercy. Or if, you know, when the in some countries, the governor or the president can say, you know, you're free to go just by his mercy. That's mercy. Grace would be then if that judge takes the person into their home to look after them and live with them. That's grace, because he doesn't 
That's completely unmerited. Right? So if you sort of see the difference in mercy and grace in those two situations, which, by the way, both of those things God did for us, didn't he? He let us go free in his mercy, but he also took us into his family in grace. And I've just it hit me recently that the two parts, those two things are also fundamental to the passion, the Easter story. Because mercy is seen in the death of Jesus, because he took our sin on himself. That's why we don't have to pay that debt. He paid it for us. In his mercy, he, we don't have to pay it. But then in his grace was the resurrection. Because in his grace, the resurrection brings eternal life to us. So that's a gift that we do not deserve, is eternal life and living with him forever. So mercy and grace, death and resurrection, there's kind of a, a link there as well. So these patterns are who God is, and it's in everything. Now, God doesn't have to save us. And it doesn't have to do anything for our benefit, but it's that fundamental love that we start with. It means he acts in mercy and grace to create a people group. So in order to save us, he need a saviour. So in order to have a saviour, you need people to, for that saviour to come into. So he created the, or he set aside the, the, the people of Israel to prepare them for Jesus to, to come through them. Now, since we're focusing on mercy, this is clearly seen in the fact that Jesus still came. Even though Israel, as a, as a people group, and like all of us really, we continually offended God. This whole story through the Old Testament is Israel messing up, messing up, messing up. But he still carried through there. Now, as Deuteronomy 4.31 said, For the Lord at your God is a merciful God. He will not leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them. That's the message to, to, through Moses to the people of Israel that day. You know, you, you're messing up, but I'm going to stick with the plan. Okay, so that brings us to the next point, which is God is patient. If you think about the, the bit from when he called Abraham, so that's when he started the, the Jewish idea, the, the Israel. To Jesus is nearly 2,000 years. So that's pretty patient, trying to build that up. In 2 Peter 3.9, where uh, Peter is speaking about God's judgment of the world by sin and fire and all that, this is what uh, Peter writes, The Lord is not slow to fulfil his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So that's the other side of patience. He was patient back in the Old Testament, but he's patient now. A lot of you know, we sort of feel like, Lord, come back, I've had enough of this, or some of those people, some of us think that. But he is patient. He wants everyone to come to know God, to know himself. So there's that balance between, you know, we want to be with Christ, but we want to, as many as possible to know him as well. So... So there's that patience of God that we need to learn in ourselves. So all, all these attributes we need to learn ourselves as well. And it's also, yeah, back to the, you know, when the first time he came, so we're waiting for the second time he's coming, but the first time he came, it seemed like a long time to wait. But it was God's right time. So everything happens in God's right time. So next is on to being his, hum, his humility, being humble. So at the right time, so this is where we see when Jesus did come the first time, he, God humbled himself to become a Jewish man. And not simply to become a man, but as far as being demeaned and crucified and killed for our sins. So that is humility that we can't even fathom. God the Creator going that far, not just become a man, but become a despised man. And Philippians 2, 6-8 tells us that. Talk about Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped or held on to. He didn't hold on to that. But emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So that whole passion event was humility, humiliation, if you could say, is a related word. 
But it was also an act of incredible strength and power in his character, for one thing. So we'll go to powerful next. So this is God's power. Now there's lots of ways we see God's power. We'll just quickly mention a few. We, this is one we mentioned yesterday, is his resurrection. So some have been resurrected, like Lazarus, and the kids had a story, some of you would have heard the story about Jairus' daughter. So that was when Jesus resurrected those people, but that was just resuscitation in a sense. They were dead, but they became alive. But Jesus resurrected himself to eternal life. I mean, he had eternal life the whole time, but he resurrected himself. So what kind of power must you have if you raise yourself? Yeah, creating the universe with a word is one thing. <clears throat> Rising from the dead is a, is a whole new level. Because creating the universe doesn't really cost much. You just spoke and that happened. But dying and rising again, that cost God a lot. It cost Jesus his life and he came, he came back to life. And also in our salvation, you think about we've fallen, what does that take? So, I'm going to read to you Isaiah 52, verse 10. Take this as a statement to the evil powers in the world. This is, this is Yahweh speaking. The Lord has bared his holy arm. And just that phrase, bared his holy arm, gives you the idea of power and strength. But holy arm is often a reference to a hint, hint about Jesus, the arm of God, the hand of God. The Lord has bared his holy arm on the cross. Think of that. <laughs> Before the eyes of all nations... And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. So it's going across the whole world, this truth of who God is and Jesus, his son. So it's, he's powerful there and he's also powerful in his work through us, his children. And changing objects of wrath, who we are, is by his amazing power to be children of God. And then have you ever thought about the coordination of all the events in the world, all the things that happen? He's in control of that. That's power that you can't fathom. And then in his dealing with evil in the world, you know, you don't know how much evil God is holding off from us in protection and his power to preserve us as his children and bring us to where he wants us to be. So they could go on about power for a long time, but so that they're dealing with evil is power, but it's also we see the outworking of God's holiness. Okay? He's protecting his children in holiness. And that, uh, that holiness expresses itself in justice. So that's the next one, is just. At the bottom there. So his justice is most clearly seen on the cross, and someone mentioned that yesterday when we talked about this. So sin is paid for. There's no debt anymore outstanding between God and man. Now, with that debt removed, it's all about faith and a willingness for a relationship with him. So also this means that those who don't believe, cannot go on forever in their sin, okay, because of God's justice. If they don't accept the fact that Jesus paid for their sin and, st- and, and still love their sin and hold their sin, then they have no basis for a relationship with God. And those people will get what their deeds dictate and what their heart really wants, which is eternal separation from God. If you reject Jesus, that's what you're saying. I don't want you, God. And you get that eternal separation from God. And there may be some punishment on earth like as God tries to get them to pay attention to what they're doing but it's in a redemptive way he tries to wake them up yes, but it's not in a balancing the scales kind of way it's not like you've done this wrong so I'm going to punish you like this so you learn your lesson it's not that kind of God doesn't do that but it is simply justice though that someone who refuses Jesus Christ spends their eternity absent from all that is good about God that's justice. So God honours their wishes effectively, so that's fair and it's just. He's, he's just. Okay, so with sin dealt with on the cross, God can now justly exercise his mercy. So there's a few of the points we've had, which opens the way for relationship. So he's personal, so that relationship can now happen. See, all this has to fit in first before that relationship can happen. So now God's own spirit will live in those of faith in Jesus. So that, that means you're in Christ. You're in the family, you're in Christ is in you. And he will yeah, have a relationship with us and commune with us. As John 14, 23, uh, in there Jesus said, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, 
and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. He meant her, of course. This is not just males. But that's what it's all about. It's God coming to know us and be with us and, and love us. Because God, if you put it in a current kind of way, he wants to hang out with us. But he, you know, we have these things to deal with first. And he has to make us ready for that. It's not us. We can't make ourselves ready. We just have to allow him to make us ready. So those ultimate barriers to relationship, so sin and death, they've been removed as barriers. But the reality takes time in our lives, and we can all attest to that. I'm sure we, we I go up and down and we have our moments. But over time, the Holy Spirit shapes us. He conforms us more to his love, which is, remember, that first point. Now, this is fundamentally Christian and is utterly unlike any other religion that God is preparing his people for that relationship like that. And I've just been reading a book, it's really got me in, actually, The Death of a Guru. It's about a Hindu man. And I've got to the point where he's just about to give his life to Jesus, but just all those struggles and when he realises the, the falseness of the, the Hindu beliefs and that all these gods, he's been trying to please the gods, but they don't care about him. And all of a sudden he realises that God cares about him, the true God. And it's just hit him that there's this relational aspect. So I'm looking forward to finishing that book about halfway through. So yes, God is personal. It's really distinctive. Now, God does this as a loving father, so he's gentle. Now, he's also firm and necessary, of course, but he's always measured in his firmness. But, yes, yeah, so he, most of the time, predominantly, he's he characterising as gentle with us. And Isaiah 40, verse 11, puts that this way. He tends his flock like a shepherd. Think of this picture. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. So those that have young have got lots of distractions. There's things on their hearts. <laughs> he gently leads those. So that's encouragement for everyone, I think. There. But also, you know, see how he carries us close to his heart. Like when you carry a lamb, you go and find that the lost lamb. He picks us up. So he's like, we're like an injured lamb, we're close to his heart and under his eye. And if God's got you like that, do you think anything can take you out? No, you're, you're protected, you're safe. So at least you know anything that does happen to you when you're in that situation is God has allowed it and it's for a reason. So that's encouragement as well. But God is gentle. He's also faithful. He will never let us go. So once God's spirit is in us, that's God's deposit, as you know, Ephesians 1 talks about God's spirit being a deposit. And he's faithful to bring us all the way to completion. So, the salvation to the uttermost, it says, in Hebrews 7.25. And we'll be with him in physical person one day. So we can depend on him more than we can depend on anything in this world. No matter what it is. So, we know that verse, he will never leave us or forsake us. He's faithful. And that's from Hebrews 13, verse 5. He will never leave us or forsake us. It's actually originally from the Old Testament, but it's quoted there. But I talk about the Hebrews one because John MacArthur, he uh, interprets the Greek this way. Because it's really unusually arranged, the Greek. There's lots of negatives in there. So he says, what it's basically saying is this. There is absolutely no way whatsoever that I will ever, ever leave you. So the point is that Jesus, God is trying to really drive, drive that home. I'm not going to leave you alone. He's faithful. He'll always work to that same goal too, that, you know, that even when things get hard, he's still working through that, through that plan with us, in us. It's when things get hard, it's God's loving and faithful discipline. He hasn't dropped you, he's still holding you. He's holding you tighter than ever. And the question is, do you believe that when things go hard? That's, that's what it comes down to. God will put you in a hard thing to, see, to say, do you still believe that I, I'm holding you? He's faithful, are we? Okay, just a couple more. So we're in a fallen world, so pain will happen. But when all's said and done with this groaning universe, the fullness of God's attributes will have been seen. So, see, if, if Eden had just been Eden, you would have seen God's love and his person, personal relationship. But there's so much more about God that we don't know until 
we get in this fallen world and we have to rely on him a bit. So when everything has been seen, everything good that exists in the relationship between God and mankind will be seen to be his work, by his initiative, at his cost, and because of his love. Is there anything about our work in there? No? His work, his initiative, his cost, and his love. That means he will receive all the glory and praise. So he is exalted. And if this all didn't happen, in, you know, he may not be quite as exalted in our eyes at least. Remember, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So you either do that now or you do that later. Do it now. He's always exalted, but he will be acknowledged as such by every single created being. So you know, faithful men and women... Even unfaithful men and women will one day uh, confess him. All the elect angels, the the good angels, and all the fallen angels, they will also acknowledge him. And Satan himself will confess the majesty of God one day. So as Paul puts it in Ephesians 1, 9-10, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. So this is the, the story of Christ here. As a plan for the fullness of time. What's the plan for the fullness of time? The rest of that verse says, to unite all things in him, in Jesus. Things in heaven and things on earth. So not just earth, it's the whole creation will be under Christ. And he will be exalted. Doesn't this sound good? I think that's a good plan. (laughs) Because God is good. So what he does and what he brings about is good and he wants the best. And of course this leads us all the way back to love, which is the relational aspect of his goodness. Because someone can be good, but in relationship that goodness shows as a good relationship. So I hope going through that has given you a bigger picture of both God and his incredible plan for us and for all his creation as well. It's not just us, not just us safe people, it's for everyone Uh, and for the, the whole the whole of creation and his plan is the outworking of who he is his character, all these aspects of who he is so go back to our little demonstration yesterday we have to hold all these things in balance so when you get all these attributes in balance then uh, we've got the right understanding of who God is so we need to take note of all these aspects of God's character and like I said this is only 12, you can go through the Bible and make a massive list but we've got to work to balance up who he is, or otherwise we go off different tra- tracks. So and our job is to work with him in that grand plan for his majesty and his love to be known and to have a relationship with him. So that's my message for today. So let's pray. Lord, thank you just for the great God you are, Lord. We can't exhaust the truth of your character and your love and all these things that we've looked at today, Lord. There's so many more. We thank you that you've blessed us to be able to read these things in your word and and understand you as you speak to us through circumstances too and through your word and um, just in our hearts, Lord, we thank you for your personal touch. Lord, may those we meet be able to have that personal relationship with as well, Lord, help us to bring the truth to them so that we can share this incredible blessing that we have. So we thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen.